When you spend your lunch hour at Alice Keck Park, you shouldn't be concerned about exposure to pesticides or herbicides. When the kids are playing at the shipwreck section of Chase Palm Park, toxic ground cover should be the last thing on your mind. The same goes when you're playing soccer at Dwight Murphy Field or softball at Pershing Park. But if it did cross your mind, no worries. Well, when we talk about percentages, we're 98% green and 2% uh, yellow. 98% of Santa Barbara's parks are pesticide-free. That means that 1,475 out of 1,500 acres of public green space are pesticide-free. Under the city of Santa Barbara's color-coded model, pesticide-free means green. Yellow means a small amount of pesticides are used. We have uh, 39 parks that are now green, officially green. We have uh, 10 other parks that are green with some yellow in, in them. It's protecting the current resources in our community for the next generation and the generation after that. So over the last decade, the Parks and Recreation Department staff has studied and tested ways to eliminate weeds and pests without using toxics, instead using organic materials in a program called Integrated Pest Management, or IPM. Santa Barbara has always had a high commitment to protecting the environment, and this is an extension of that. The people who work with the city in looking at what our role is, um, we certainly feel that. The best situation would be to be, you know, to, to use none of those red and yellow materials, meaning the more toxic materials, use none of them from here on out. But as a, as a cost factor, that's impossible to do just in the next year we're going to need to transition over a few years to, to, to going 100% green. In mid-February, the City Council adopted a Pesticide Hazard and Exposure Reduction Program, or FAIR, for keeping parks as green as possible. What that looks like at ground level is played out in dozens of scenarios each day. In regards to having uh, the weed growth growing around certain structures like this, we would handle it by just taking a weed whip and weed whipping it around. Many other cities would actually take uh, a herbicide and try to burn an edge around it, and we're no longer uh, we're doing that. The most commonly known commercial weed killer is Roundup. It's convenient, but it's also not green. In 2000, the city used 37 gallons of Roundup. In 2004, the city used 12 gallons of the herbicide. And last year, in 2005, city parks crews used just five gallons. We always go through and sit down and decide what the best method is to eradicate this and we always take into consideration uh, our IPM strategy that we work very closely with our integrated pest advisory committee in order to form so we just don't go out and just grab a tank full of anything. But look at all these kids right here on the grass and um, the use of herbicides is tra traditionally the way they manage weeds and when you have children rolling around on the grass and walking near these areas, you have to be really mindful of what you're using. Eric Cardenas is chair of the advisory committee. The role of the advisory committee is mainly to, to work with the city staff to move the program forward and also to provide the checks and balances that are needed um, when an exemption request comes in. As part of its oversight responsibilities, the five-member advisory committee must first approve the use of an herbicide, pesticide, or fungicide before parks workers can apply it. Recently, the advisory committee denied the use of toxics to eradicate non-native plants at the Douglas Family Preserve. We need to address non-native uh, invasive species um, of plants, so we know that to be true. However, you know, a project has to be laid out to us in the most environmentally uh, appropriate way, and this includes the use of herbicides and other pesticides. So in this specific scenario, we thought that there might be a little bit more groundwork that can be done without using herbicides. In this instance, parks officials were directed to form a volunteer effort to manually remove the non-native species. Instead of all of the exemptions being granted, they're challenged. You know the process is working if some of the exemption applications are being denied. It's rare that Escobar or his park staff ever ask for exemptions. If there's something to be eradicated, the Parks Department goes as green as possible. For an example, white fly on hibiscus, white fly on, on roses. We've been using what's known as worm gold, it's worm castings. 
Or if there's a mosquito problem at the bird refuge, parks officials count on the gambusa fish to eat them. But sometimes uh, there's not enough gambusa and we would naturally go through and use a natural occurring chemical called bacillus and augment that gambusa by applying that to the water body to eradicate the mosquitoes because we definitely don't want a West Nile virus to happen in Santa Barbara. Parks crews use the Aquaside Weed Steamer, spraying hot water around palm trees at Chase Palm Park to kill weeds instead of using chemicals. To do it green, take some green. Parks officials say this non-toxic approach requires 10% more workload. We are continually trying to increase our maintenance effectiveness by using mulch and some of those methods to reduce the workload. We're also looking at some of our parks that have very extensive horticultural landscaping that perhaps might be able to be simplified and reduce the workloads. And city leaders are budgeting for upfront capital improvements like creating most strips to save on labor costs down the line. One of the areas that, that pesticides are used the most is on the edges of parks and uh, that's where we need to make some of the capital changes to make it easier to, to hoe by hand there or easier to remove weeds by hand there. Escobar mentioned earlier that 10 parks are coated green and yellow. These are open space parks like Honda Valley, Hidden Valley, and Franceschi. Roundup would be used, for example, at, say, Franceschi Park, the lower area where you would have a major stand of poison oak that needed to be eradicated for worker safety. So we'd go through and use a little bit of that. Escobar says he looks at two criteria the hazard and the potential for human exposure. If the exposure potential is low, such as at Franceschi Park, his workers will consider using material like Roundup. But when exposure potential is high, such as at Alameda Park, no toxic materials are used. We're going to try to make sure that we can use the least toxic alternatives in 98% of our parkland, and then in the other 2%, we're going to try to uh, reduce it as much as possible and try to make eventually transition those, those places in the next few years to also using the least toxic means. The Mission Rose Garden is controlled with the use of neem oil and other organic materials. However, on a rare occurrence, a fungicide may be necessary to keep these famous flowers alive. That's not going to be a problem for long because the people who are managing the rose garden are replacing also the roses that are dying off with ones that are more um, uh, fungus tolerant meaning they can handle, uh, they can survive without the use of a lot of fungicides there. And so I think we're going to get there. It's just going to take a little, a uh, couple years. Basically, our golf course is green. So our greens aren't green. They're uh, considered special circumstance. But, but if and when we do have to spray, it's because Mother Nature is just throwing a curveball at us that we can't overcome. Jorgensen is in charge of maintaining Santa Barbara Municipal Golf Course. Keeping the greens free of fungus is a year-round chore. Every two weeks, he whips up a brew of microbes in a compost tea to spread over the greens. The good bugs in the tea compete with the fungus for food and eliminates, in most cases, the need for fungicides. It creates this bath of uh, soluble nutrients, and it's got beneficial fungi and bacteria it's got beneficial nematodes and protozoa, and it creates this bath, and we load this into our spray tank, and we spray it foliarly on our greens. The reduced use of fungicides also helps prevent the runoff of toxic materials. We're the start of Las Positas Creek, and then that goes into Arroyo Burro and, and out to the ocean. So we're very cognizant of that. We, we want to spray the least chemicals that we can. There is much more yard space in this city than there is park space. And, and so, uh, you know, the city could stop doing pesticides entirely and we could still have pesticides running off into our ocean and creeks. So it really comes down to what individuals decide to do. Part of the city's FAIR program is public education and soliciting public volunteers. Homeowners can play an important role by choosing, for instance, an alternative application such as Matron off the store shelf instead of a chemical like Roundup. Um, maybe that's something as easy as looking at what alternative products the city is using and asking if that product might be 
usable in a home setting as well. Um, I think there's a lot going on in the city that residents can learn from because of the known impacts to waterways, the known impacts to species, um, water quality. My gardener wanted to just come in and spray it regularly. And so now what I do is I mulch it. And I, that's how I take care of all the weeds. So homeowners can use mulch very effectively. Gardeners can also put in weed fabric, weed barriers, which really reduces the um, later appearance of weeds in your gardens. The city has over 60 volunteers who help maintain the Mission Rose Garden, but there are many other parks without any citizen stewards. You know, 49, 50 parks all under this IPM program, and in order to really maintain these at a level that we would all like to see, I think volunteers are going to be a critical component. Once that is established, we could have neighborhoods adopt any specific park, and then you have a pool of 20 to 50 volunteers that could go at that park and do whatever needs to be done.